Hello, um, my name's Katie. Um, I'm a small animal vet from just outside Manchester. Um, and despite the voice in my head right now that is saying, turn this camera off, stop recording and stop making a big fool of yourself, I'm here to talk about veterinary mental health. Um, mainly coming from a standpoint of the fact that it's something I've struggled with. Um, and secondly, from the fact that I found something that's really helped and really worked for me and I just want to share, see if it helps anyone else. So, at the moment, I am really sad actually and kind of upset at reading on Facebook about people wanting to come out of the profession, people wanting to switch careers, seeing people just typing that they've had a bad year. You know, and the worst, worst thing obviously is our really high suicide rate and I'm hoping that maybe something from what I see is going to help people and that's what's stopping me not listening to this voice in my head that's saying stop it you're a bit crazy go and mow the lawn go do your shopping get to the gym you've not been enough times today go and do something else and put the computer down but you know I was watching a video and I thought you know what if it helps someone, then excellent. If you think I'm crazy, then even better because it's far more interesting than being boring. Um, so, as I say, um, a little bit about me. Um, the last year for me, well, probably the last two years has been quite tough. Um, at the time, I don't think I knew they were tough. At the time, I was just fulfilling what I thought needed to be done until I had a moment where I realised that things couldn't go on the way that they were. So um, I was a typical, typical vet really, um, grew up as a bit of a high flyer, good grades, um, I supported parents, I had a good upbringing, a good childhood, I can't say that there was anything to complain about on that front. Um, I think the person that was hardest on me through my childhood was probably myself because I always thought that your level has to be up here, you have to get 100%, you have to get full marks, you have to get top of the class every time and if I didn't then I'd probably, scarily so for my age, be, be very harsh on myself about not doing that and I don't think that helps that you then go through through vet school, through university where it is possible still to get very high marks and then you plummeted into a career where you can't control everything and you certainly can't do everything perfectly either. So the first couple, sort of first year as a new graduate, typical new graduate, finding your feet, figuring out what works for you, stayed in a job for nine months and thought ridiculously busy, um, open surgeries, really cheap consults, I'd learnt a lot of primary surgical skills and I thought, you know, I want to do something new now and went into what is essentially a brilliant job that I'm still working now, um, lovely 20 minute consultations, it's a luxury, um, lovely clients, amazing boss, really nice colleagues, but in the background I still had this little perfectionist voice that was tapping its way away and as I got more skilled in my career and as I progressed more, this voice was always looking for things that I could have been doing wrong. And it gets to the point of ridiculousness where there wouldn't be anything that was wrong in a realistic situation, but this voice wasn't realistic. This voice would say, those clients haven't booked in to see you again because they didn't like you. Or, you didn't mention that its ART value was one point above normal and actually what if they go back and what if it's scanned in six months time and it actually has a liver mass? Or, it'd say, those clients have switched vets and you were the last one to see them. It might have been 18 months ago, but obviously it must be you. You must have done something wrong. And it would say, watch that bitch spear really carefully because it's probably going to bleed, even though that's never happened. And it will progressively get to the point where I'd say to people, oh, the results will be back for you tomorrow. Uh, um, and then I'd... I'd report them the next day but I think that wasn't soon enough or I'd end up with this this voice in my head of saying you need to triple double check that or if something ended up actually going wrong or not being done for example then I'd think you know what it probably was because I wasn't in work long enough so actually what you need to do is spend a little bit longer there 
even though on reflection that wasn't really physically possible and then you can control that not happening or I'd end up doing absolutely nearly everything myself because I didn't trust anyone else this little voice would say you're the worst person you could do it all and it ended up that I was in work for ridiculous numbers of hours trying to make sure that I was doing everything absolutely perfectly spot on double triple covering my back if I had a day off I'd have to write like war and peace of instructions and I know that's a really really extreme example but I was setting the standards higher and higher and higher and as I got better that standard got higher as well and it meant that I was actually a really rubbish person to work alongside as well because despite the fact that I was doing a very good job if something didn't get done then I would be ultimately unforgiving about that like why is this not being done I wrote it in the list it was there what more can I do and what you don't realize is that those same those people have also got the same voice in their head saying equally different things but um the voice would also say like you should have more of a plan by now you should be on your way to buying a practice should you not be going into academia maybe you need to do some more qualifications and i listened to the voice you know i did my cert avp it didn't change anything because it was saying then no it needs to be a designated certificate or for example um it'd be saying you know you'll be much happier if you move out of your parents and get a house of your own so i did that yeah, same again you need a new car now or you need the front of the garden doing and that'll make you happy or you get fit and enter a few sporting events and it would always be like happiness will come when happiness will come when you've done this or everything will be all right once that's happened and you'd live for the weekend and it was getting to the point where i thought you know what this is unsustainable this is making me miserable and i remember it getting to a day where i thought i can't do this i can't do this anymore I was exhausted. I found that the demands that were put on me by myself were probably even worse than the ones that were by client, staff or patients. And I had such a massive imposter syndrome, like despite however many qualifications, extra things that were given to me, all compliments that were given to me, I did not believe any of them. However many of like, I don't know, these thingies, nominee of the year thingies, I just think, must have been a fluke, can't really be me. No one else can can do as, as meticulous a job as I can, but that's just me trying to cover up the fact that I'm actually a big fraud and that I'm not this great person and amazing bet that everyone keeps telling me that I am. And I ended up to the point where I was going to do something stupid because I thought that life can't carry on like this. You know, if this if this is how things are, if I was born to to work and pay the bills and that's it, then this this isn't how things are meant to end out. I, you know, this is me finished. And luckily, I have very a very supportive boss who persuaded me that maybe I actually need to go to the doctor because. It was beyond beyond belief. Um, and ultimately, I did go to the doctors. Um, they sent me to CBT. But obviously, that little voice kicks in again that says, yeah, but she doesn't really know how it is being a vet. You know, she's just a CBT practitioner. <laughs> Ignore her. And it'd be exercises like, you, you're due to finish at four o'clock, therefore leave at four. And you'd be like, oh, I'm very sorry, GDV, I'll have to leave, it's four o'clock. And it didn't happen. So I tried with it, but it just didn't work. So then I ended up on a little bit of a, a path of, of self-discovery, as it were. <laughs> Not even self-discovery, trying to, to fix myself because I actually thought that I was broken. And I started by reading Jim Rohn, Tony Robbins, um, Earl Nightingale, um, anyone that I could find, like, absolute ridiculous, I have oodles of these things, like, what's this, The Good Psychopath's Guide to Success, How to Use Your Inner Psychopath to Get the Most Out of Life, for real, 
I thought this was going to help. <laughs> and okay, to start with it helps. I had this big plan, you know, I'm going to live on Palm Beach, sipping my cocktails, having a lovely time. And slowly then, this voice, it loved the goals for a little while. Yeah, something to aim for, something to work for. And then after a while it was like, yeah, but you didn't get that, but did you? No, you are actually rubbish. You, you stay below your station there and don't try and get above it because I've seen you try before and you always fail. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then eventually I came across a course um, called Broadband Consciousness by Richard Wilkins and Liz Ivory and it actually made a lot of sense. And basically it's saying that this negative voice in your head is actually what you call the script which is just a, a physical form of what you've learned through your life from experiences of family, friends, the media, vet school, what you read, what you listen to and it's like a pre-filled range of ideas of how you should react to situations what you think about yourself, your self-worth. So for example, you, it might start early on like, okay, so when we have no money, we start worrying or watch the parents do that. Watch my mum walking in the mirror, so you've got to be skinny to be happy. And then it might get to the point of, as you're getting a bit further through the career, you've got to come top of the class to be happy. If, you don't get 100% then you're actually useless. If you wear designer trainers then you're one of the cool kids and even to the point of when you're in vet school if you do something wrong the client's going to complain. If someone didn't want to see you again it must be because you did a bad job and this this is like a reference that plays continuously in the back of your mind like shit fm like honestly on repeat, playing all the time, and this would jump in at ridiculous points to me of like going out for coffee with friends, and it'd jump in and be like, I wonder if that dog came back in over the weekend again. Because this will always jump to worst case scenario, it's always going to jump to the worst. It will distort, delete, and generalize everything that has ever happened. It will make every situation that you look back on seem a million times worse. It will spotlight and magnify what happened and make it seem like something completely different and there's a really interesting neurologist called Moran Surf that says every time you revisit a memory the way that you revisit it then changes it so you can make something that was nothing seem like the worst scenario worst situation ever and this is partly responsible for that because if you don't choose how you're feeling about a situation or about something that's happened this will jump in and wheedle its way in and choose for you so it will always jump to say the worst case scenario is going to happen. So the bitch stays coming around a bit slowly, but it's still got really pink mucous membranes, it's still got normal heart rate, it's still got good blood pressure, but this is saying it's bleeding out, it's bleeding out. And whilst some, you, minus this, can say, yep, yeah, I'm aware that um, post-operative hemorrhage is a risk and I'm monitoring, but all of these parameters say it's not bleeding out. This instead is like, yeah, bleeding out, bleeding out. Or you've just an anesthetotomy and you're re-x-raying and you know that you've done your absolute best at the time to get every single stone out. You re-x-ray it and the x-ray is processing and you're looking and you're like, there's going to be a stone. There's going to be a stone. <laughs> and there's not, there's not. Like it comes down to two two things I always think of. The first one is a Richard Wilkins quote that I actually have written and sat on my desk and it says, every genuine mistake is simply a good intention that didn't go according to plan. Like you look back on a situation and you know that at the time you did 100% because you're good people, we are good people, we've gone into the profession because we want to help animals. We like people, we like animals, and the trouble is that this is making us hate the job, making us see all the negative aspects of it and none of the positive ones. The second quote is here. I had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. Mark Twain. That is absolutely right. Like another Richard Wilkins thing, 
why is it that we all worry about the future in advance but we don't enjoy the future in advance? So <laughs> there's a quote actually from Fantastic Beasts and How to Find Them that says Worry once, suffer twice. And we all spend, I know I did, spending so much time worrying. It's exhausting, physically exhausting, because this will make you worry, 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 worry. And you know what the the great thing to be able to do is you have to discredit this. This amount of things that have come up in the background, as Richard and Liz say, page a day through your life, of things that are pre pre programmed of how you should react, how you should feel. It's from folklore, it's from myth, it's from religion, it's from families, it's from what you've seen on the TV, it's from your friends. It is what you believe is how you should react and how situations should be and how life should be and what should make you happy. If you were to choose whether to hold on to a compliment or a criticism, what would you choose? And you know what? Everyone would choose that they want to hold on to a compliment. But we all hold on to the criticisms because this is like, remember that time when they said they didn't want to see you? Or, I don't know, remember that time when they said that that, I don't know, top didn't suit you that well and then you never wear it again. <laughs> but you don't remember the compliments of all the nice things that people ever say. Like, I... I would never remember any of the nice things, ever. I just remember all the worst things, but I know that people are the same. And this, that is a reason to discredit it. And another reason why we know this is true and this exists is because we all do so many things that we wouldn't choose to do, say, or feel on a daily basis. It's because they're in here. That's how you should react. Someone's died, you should be really sad and you should go into hide and not do anything. This patient's died, it must be your fault. And you know what? Life, technically, is can be seen as good times and lessons. And if something bad happens, use it as a lesson to make sure that doesn't happen again. Use it, look for the good things from that situation, or how you can use it to try and make sure that you're not in that situation again. Or secondly, like this will have you thinking about 95% about the problem, and only 5% about the solution. Throw that away and start thinking about how you solve a problem. And realise the most important bit of it is that you can be happy now. You are complete with absolutely everything that is there. And no car, no house, no different job, no salary. Once you're over that breadline, once you're over the poverty line, it's going to add anything else. Everything that you've got now is, is great. And you can just modify how you react to a situation. Every event plus the um, response is the outcome. Your response to what happened is the whole outcome. And I basically, I ended up on a course called Broadband Consciousness, as you say, where Liz Ivory and Richard Wilkins with the script let you realise that you can put that down and you can choose how you feel. If you're in your scripts, this is playing on Shit FM, you'll feel down, you'll feel drained. Just think, would I choose? Which one would I choose? Would I choose to feel like this or would I choose to feel happy? Because you can feel however you want to feel. Even in a crappy situation, you can feel good. And I think it's so sad that we all, as, as we say, really good people come into this career to do good for animals. And we end up listening so much to this negative voice in our heads and this rubbish that we miss out on so many good things that are happening, so many amazing things that we're doing. And yes, you can change your job, but choose. Let you choose. Don't let this choose. You actually choose. So the the last thing that I'll say, and again, without becoming an evangelical hoo-ha crazy, one Richard Wilkins thing that he always says is, what would you rather have, a lottery win or not be dead? Pretty sure I'd be not be dead. And that's the kind of way that you've got to look at these things, is that every day, the day is what you make it, and you are not dead. Ultimately, 
you're still here. You know that millionaire from London that died back in August time? Do you think that if you said to him, I'll swap you 180 million for one more day on this planet, what we've got every day, what he decides to do? And he's, it, for sure he'd go for it, he'd swap it, and he'd be back here. And this is when things escalate into evangelicalness. But I, I think it's really worthwhile checking out broadband consciousness. Secondly, I think even if you can just identify that everyone has this same voice playing to them, and sometimes when people start saying things that they wouldn't really mean, like clients get really horrible and mean, they're saying they, that's their script, that's their script talking to you. They wouldn't choose to be mean to someone, but their script is like, right, something bad's happened. Something bad's happened, so what do we do? We get angry at the other person. And you know what, your own self-worth, if that level, your relationship with yourself is good enough that then this broadband consciousness and putting that down and knowing that it's not you is like your own antivirus. We go through school and we're not given any protection for this. We let everything in and we, we believe it all. <laughs> and I certainly did. But knowing that that's not you and that you can choose and that you are enough and that your self-worth is a 10 out of 10 everything falls down from there if your identity is that you are enough regardless of what you do then you end up being a much more positive likeable interesting person that can go and live a life that they want to live and enjoy the career that they've gone into because they love animals because they love people because they love science they love problem solving and that's how you've got to look at it so I'm going to stop now because I've waffled and congratulations because you're going to think I'm crazy and you're probably right <laughs> but I really hope this has helped someone. Thank you.